Yo, what is good, NYU? You are listening to the Silence Behind the Violets podcast, episode number 15. A uh, unique one today. Kai, who do we have? We have Matt Devins, NYU athletic training, one of uh, five athletic trainers on our staff. Matt, thanks for joining us. Really, really happy to have you on. Um, first, kind of started off uh, with, with a bit of your story, your path to NYU. I know it's, it's a unique one, so tell the people. Yeah, so I, um, I uh, initially worked, uh, my first time working in New York City, I worked in Brooklyn. I was hired by the Johnson State Medical Center to work with a professional hockey team called the Aviators. Um, uh, minor league hockey, got to travel all over the Northeast with the team as the primary healthcare provider for them. Um, ran their strength and conditioning, ran their health and, and well-being on the bus, 8, 12, 15 hours at a time, uh, which was a, an incredible experience, a lot of responsibility uh, right out of graduate school. So uh, really enjoyed that, that um, experience. Um, that contract was through Downsea, like I said. So uh, they moved my position to Poly, NYU Poly, as the head athletic trainer there. Uh, NYU Poly moved my position from a contracted position to a hired on staff position, uh, which just showed that they respected what I had to offer. Um, and then, as the story goes, NYU um, picked up bought, purchased, however you want to put it, Poly as the engineering school, renamed it Tandon. Uh, I spent three years there uh, before we merged sports. They were Division three athletics as well. And with my merge to NYU, um, we brought over uh, softball and baseball uh, for the first time, for baseball in, in many years, and softball for the first time ever. Yeah, super cool. I, I, um I also am curious, like, I'm always curious about people's paths to NYU. It's always so unique. You know, Kai's was different than mine, et cetera. But, um, yeah, thanks for sharing that. As far as just some of the sports that you played growing up, you know, there is, I'm sure, a little bit of an athletic background for you. What did you, what did you play as you were growing up? So, I, growing up, I grew up on Long Island. Um, I uh, played a Little League baseball. I, I, I ran PAL track and field. Um, so, I was pretty active. Lived, grew up on the water, boating, surfing. Um, hanging out at the beach, uh, so I was pretty active as a kid. Swam, like I was, grew up on the water with a boat, so I was swimming all the time. I, I was on a swim team in the summer times. But when it came to organized sport in in junior high school, I started with cross country, and then I did wrestling and uh, then track and field. Um, after that, into high school, uh, followed in my brother's footsteps with track. We were also very very good at track, so um, we uh, so I did cross country. I did indoor track and field. Messed around with the wrestling team, wrestling team a little bit just to, to practice, have some fun, um, you know, uh, just just to get some you know fitness or, or whatever with that, that group of people. Um, and then uh, outdoor track and field, and, and we were very good in high school. We are when I was a sophomore, we won the national championship in the four by eight. Yeah. I was an alternate on that team, so I had the experience of traveling with them. Um, I ended up running in college, but my introduction to athletic training came in high school as the alternate. There were injuries that were covering, uh, were occurring with those athletes through their path. My brother being on the team, his classmates, the, those guys on that relay, um, those guys uh, had little ailments here and there that I would help stretch out and they worked out mm -hmm. and, and kind of introduced me to um, sports medicine early on. Uh, I didn't think I'd go into sports medicine, but when I started looking junior year, senior year, I, I did more research, sports medicine appealed to me. Um, I like the idea of being on the sidelines with the team, mm. traveling with the team, um, you know, developing athletes over time, three, four years at a time mm. in college, which differs from what you're going to do in the physical therapy world and, and right. other healthcare care, um, majors and, and professions. Uh, so I ended up going and, and running for you know a year at Southern Connecticut State University, mm. Division II school, and uh, had a great experience there. Unfortunately, balancing a sport and athletic training was difficult because of the time commitment for both. You have to do a lot of hours at practice and pre-practice for athletic training experience, and that right. overlapped with the time that I needed to be running. Um, I was able to manage it for a few semesters, but ultimately, once I got assigned my sports, I had to choose between the two. Um, so 
I don't regret doing that. I, I was able to continue to run and compete. I did triathlons. I still run. I'm training for half marathon mm -hmm. now. Um, so I, I stay active. I train every year for uh, lifeguarding, which I do every summer at the beach. I have to be physical fit for that. Mm -hmm. um, so I try to stay active, manage my own injuries, help people manage their other injuries. And uh, yeah. No, Matt's definitely an athlete. We've been on a couple of trips together, and I've learned that every single morning, regardless, Matt goes for a run. So, you know, we were just in Kentucky. Every morning, I get to breakfast. You know, I feel like I'm up early. I get down to breakfast maybe 8.30. I'm like, all right, Matt, where'd you run today? And taking me through the route and everything. So that's really cool to hear. Um, but I actually kind of have a – I'm just curious, you know, you talk about your sports background. Being in the industry, do most athletic trainers come from being an athlete, or do you – is there kind of a split or is there not really a lot of people outside of the athletics world who kind of come into the, into the business? Yeah, I think, I think in my coming through the sport, there's a lot of interest in um, athletics in general. You know, having been an athlete or not, people just want to live that, that lifestyle, be part of that organized sport, um, and maybe even in healthcare in that direction. But I think what happens is in college, like I, like I explained, it, it's hard to be an athlete and mm -hmm. an athletic trainer. It often scares athletes away from it, which I think uh, is unfortunate yeah. because having the background in a sport can always help you be better, um, at least relating to the patient, you know, mm -hmm. the student athlete. Um, so um, I do think there are places where you can do both, and I think they, uh, I think those people are in a better position, you know, when, yeah. when it comes to relating to the college athlete. For sure. What does one have to do to become an athletic trainer, like? like the actual like X's and O's, like the schooling component, what is that comprised of? So it, it is, a, it, it's not an easy major by any means, but it's, it's medicine, mm -hmm. uh, it's sports mm -hmm. medicine, it's uh, orthopedic evaluation, upper extremity, lower extremity. Um, so just to kind of go through the curriculum, uh, exposure is super important. So early on you'll take some anatomy classes, some base classes, um, nutrition, other things that might be base building for a sports medicine background. Mm. After um, you know a year or so of that, they start putting you, placing you with sports to get on-field experience, witnessing uh, the rigorous activities that the athletes go through. You might even see some injuries. In my first couple of semesters covering sports, I remember seeing an ACL tear in person or watching you know, ankle injury occur, and one of the things that, and this is a side note, one of the things that I always say is, you know, to, to the professionals that are going into the field now, are, you're going to get more information from watching an injury occur in real time than you will in the clinic later on, because yeah. you can see how it happened, and that often tells you exactly what the injury is. So, you know, uh, when football season is going on, my friends always, you know, text me and say, hey, what happened to this guy on the, uh, on the field? Um, was it a hamstring? Because they're talking about being an ankle. And I, you know, look at the Greek player or whatever. And yeah. <laughs> we always talk about this That's in funny. the office afterwards, you know, mm -hmm. with our staff here about like, things that make, make the, the news. Mm -hmm. So it's fun to talk about. Yeah, no, it's interesting. <clears throat> uh, speak a little bit about the teams that you work with here at NYU. So uh, I've had the opportunity to work with um, uh, this year and, and in years past, I've been assigned to men's soccer with Kim Wyan and Joe Rubrigen. Um, I, I work with women's basketball, and uh, you know Coach Barber, Nettie, uh, and um, Annie. Um, all five of them, excellent coaches. Love working with them. I never thought I would have so much interest in basketball mm -hmm. or soccer, but it's really that core group of coaching staff that helps me uh, be as successful as I can. Um, they're elevating their athletes to another level. My expectation goes up for the athlete. The communication has to be there. Um, and, and those um, coaches set a standard uh, of success from the start. Right. And I thrive in that, um, which I think their athletes do as well. Uh, I also work with, with tennis. This is the first year I'm working with tennis. Um, have had some exposure in the past to working with tennis um, for some professional athletes um, in the World Tennis League. Um, just covering some sports and, and their, their characters um, yes. <laughs> in their own right. Uh, tennis, tennis people are, are entertaining to be around, and, and I've had some great experiences with them this year. I look forward to working with Horace and, and his athletes moving forward. Uh, so those are the teams I currently cover. I had a great opportunity a couple of years ago 
of working with softball uh, in their mm -hmm. inaugural few seasons, oh, yeah. which was an incredible experience. I think right out of the gate, we, we won the ECAC um, with a ragtag group of girls. And uh, you know, Coach uh, Noala was excellent at embracing that moment. Um, and uh, you know, I, 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 just so they were successful down in Florida, I, yeah. I wish the best for them because I, I always think Noel is um, capable of, of, of winning, having a winning uh, team. Hundred percent, absolutely. I have two things, both like semi-related to men's basketball. One, when we were hiring a new men's basketball head coach, I remember there were a couple of times, or rather, there were there were. Um, time slots in which we could meet with those candidates and just ask general questions. They could be super light or, or not. And I remember you specifically asking who we ended up going with, Dave Klatsky, like, hey, what's your communication style look like with, you know, with your uh, sports medicine staff um, and stuff like that. And I thought that that was a really interesting point because, like, I've worked in, in Division three athletics for, like, I don't know, like five years now. But, like, I never really got to see – like the actual interaction between the two because that typically happens behind closed doors. And so to be a part of a closed door conversation or like Q&A like that, mm -hmm. it, was pretty, it was pretty cool to, to look behind the curtain in that way. The other thing I had was, I think it was, yeah, I was with men's basketball when they went to the NCAA tournament in Ohio. And Stuart, who was with us, our athletic director, he was saying, oh yeah, like, like Kim and men's soccer because he went with them to Messiah. It, um, he goes, they know how to eat right. So, like, is, is it true that Kim, like, never skips on her meals, like, at the hotel and stuff like that? Oh, for, I mean, every time I travel with the team, the meals are, we're always asking the staff to put out more food. <laughs> and while you're at the team, there is no doubt about that. That's true. Whether it's women's basketball or men's soccer or women's yeah. softball, I mean, they just eat. And they eat because they're working hard. Of course. Right? Mm -hmm. There's no doubt about that. I think, I don't know if you, you've touched on this in, in podcasts in the past, but the unique thing that happened at men's soccer, not this past year, but a year before, right. was there was a stoppage of the game. And coach handled that so with such class and without stress. Um, once we figured out that the game was going to continue, we realized how much time we had. And we went back, and our team ate dinner. <laughs> and we came back to the field and played again. We ended up winning the game, scoring right. with like two minutes to go, and then winning in overtime, which was an absolutely incredible thing to have happen um, with all odds against you. But part of that was the guys needed food, and they <laughs> right. ate. Refueled. You mentioned something about the communication factor, and I think uh, something that is not always looked at. Um, with the athletic training staff at other schools is the athletic training staff and the strength and conditioning coaches are part of the staff and the support system mm -hmm. leading to the success of your team. You know, the coaches bring in these athletes that have athletic ability and are talented and work hard mm -hmm. and then the strength and conditioning coaches and the medical staff are meant to do injury prevention and get the athletes to be able to maintain their fitness and health throughout the entire season. And that cannot happen without good communication between the athlete and the coaches. And all three having conversations regularly because you're just not gonna get there. And um, it's a key component to the success of the athletes at NYU. Yeah. I think that's why I was excited to have you on and other members of the sports medicine staff as well when, they, when we do get to have them on. but. Like, we, we have student athletes on all the time, and obviously we very much appreciate the rela relationship we have with them. But I also appreciate the relationship that we have with each other uh, on the support staff because we're all kind of working toward the common goal anyways. And plus, what you two in particular can relate to is when I was an, an athletic communications grad assistant, I was always the first at the field, always the last to leave the field or court, whatever. But right next to me was always the sports medicine staff. So you guys, I mean, you are very familiar with each other in terms of that same timeline. So let's just take, for example, let's say, just to put into perspective on a support staff side of things, 7 p.m. women's basketball tip-off. It could be men's soccer, too. Mm -hmm. But, like, 7 p.m. So, Kai, what time are you getting there, and what time are you getting there? He's definitely there earlier than me. At the latest, I'm there at 5.30, but I would try to be there at 5, five. two hours early. How yeah. about you, Matt? Yeah, I mean, 5 o'clock sounds about right. Maybe before mm -hmm. that, because mm -hmm. not only do we have to set up and prepare and NYU soon, but we have to bring everything with us. Mm -hmm. um, where we go, but um, I want to be there before the athletes arrive so that we can um, properly 
have everything we need in order for when they come in, they take the treatments, whatever needs to get done is, is systematic and, and quick and, and in and out. Um, if, if I'm causing a delay in any way, it's only hurting the team. Uh, mm -hmm. So being there early is, is, is definitely a key component for that. And then what time are you guys each leaving? So we have to be the last ones out. Um, That's right. After the competition, I mean, I, there's nothing I can do during the game to get someone ready for the next day. I have all right. my work done beforehand right. and after, right? So afterwards, I'm picking up the pieces, and beforehand, I'm preparing them for the game. So there's nothing I can do during the game except for maybe in an on-field or on-court injury that occurs, and it's a quick evaluation, you know, but, but all my hard work comes on the road. If it's on the road, it's in the hotel room, in the lobby, doing treatments, or walking them through a, a, um, a pool workout or a stretch routine mm. or doing treatments, leading to rolling out, whatever is necessary for the team as a whole or an individual to be successful. You know, the athletes know my routine. Uh, they'll ask me to, to, to meet with them to, to do a scraping um, or a right. grasping technique on their foot or, or you know, a, a quick uh, stretch or, or massage um, on, on, a, on an adhesion or not, not in their calf, but, you know, and that happens, you know, individually or in group sessions throughout the preparation of making for the game. So for, just for a short example is, you know, we were just at a women's basketball um, NCAA tournament and, you know, as soon as the first game was over, we knew we had won, we were moving on. Everything that we do from that moment leading to the next game yeah. has to be health and well-being in my eyes, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. So whether we do some kind of, you know, shakeout, whether we, and I'm always talking to the coaches about what we can do next to get us going um, and prepare us. They're thinking the same thing. They're, they're looking at plays, they're looking at, you know, direction. So if I can take something off their plate and, and think about fitness and, and think about, you know, shakeouts and, and right. health and well-being, then, then we're working as a, as a team. Right. What time are you leaving, Kai? Like, let's say recap written included. 10.30 probably. Yeah, um, so like a 7 to 9 o'clock is really, a, you know, a 10.30 for you. 5 to 10.30, like, probably yeah. spent some time in the office that day as well. Of um, course, of yeah. course. Um, yeah, it's for, for both of you, it's a lot of uh, hurry up and wait, and then wait and hurry up. Yeah. But that's the nature of it, right? Yeah. I'm fielding text messages and emails. And, you All know, the way. And personalities. And, right. you know, Coach like, what can I expect out of her or him? And then I'm like, honestly, we'll see. Yeah. I'm going to be straight with you. We'll see. They're, they went through a tough injury at the moment. And that communication happens after the game, you know, after practice, right, right on through the, the opportunity for them to, to be out on the field next. Yeah. You brought up the point about, like, when uh, women's basketball won one evening for the NCAA tournament and just like, hey, like, you know, the next day, the coaching staff, they've got enough on their plate with planning and scouting and all that. Like, if there's anything I could take off of their plate. Like, for me, it was the same thing when I got to travel for the NCAA tournament with the men where, you know, jokingly on the bus, Roy goes, oh, Chris, the assistant coach, Chris Thompson, Chris, like, you don't have to worry about social media this weekend. Like, you know, you can just worry about coaching, winning the game. And Chris, like, deep exhale, he goes, don't got to tell me twice. You know, like, just the same idea of just, you know, take something off somebody's plate mm -hmm. in order for them to, uh, to, you know, to do what they, what they are, are meant to do. The next thing we wanted to get into was just relationships with student athletes here. You began to talk a little bit about the teams that you handle here, but maybe you have a couple of stories from each program that you oversee and really the relationships you've been able to develop, whether it be a current or even a past student athlete. So I guess we'll start with the NYU athlete. There's no doubt that NYU um, creates an environment for success in the classroom and on the field or on the court. And uh, because of that, our student athletes, they're, they're smart and they're aware of what they're going through. And the sometimes more information for them to see how things are going to play out and to see, um, you know, learn what they're going through um, is, is super important. You know, it's very important that they're aware of, of things. Um, so I think um, Google and WebMD hurt us because if they are seeing something on the internet and looking up something that's happening to them, it always goes to the worst case scenario, right? So, um, and, I, and we're aware of that as medical staff. We're, we're aware of that and we like to always say, listen, just talk to us, tell us what's going on, let's, let's figure it out, let's be in person, let's, let's have a text exchange, whatever it, may, it might be, um, just to get you to a place where we're going to move forward from this and not dwell on the worst case scenario. 
and I can't promise it's in its goodness. You know, you might already know it's something you know tough like an ACL tear or, or something you know worse or dislocated, whatever it is. It's it, it's potentially a tough you know situation. So some of my my favorite. Um, moments, and, and I'm going to be general because we've seen a lot of injuries in this in this area um, over the years. Uh, is an ACL tear. You have an athlete that's performing at peak performance. They're completely enjoying the season, watching the success, even if it's taking into the season, and they go down with a really tough injury. Uh, a big question mark on whether the season's going to continue or not. And immediately we have to, you know not worry about the future, worry about the moment, communicate to them the short-term goals, you know, whatever that might be, uh, usually figuring out that it's whatever injury it is, and sometimes the mechanism of the injury is an ACL tear, and doesn't necessarily play out to be an ACL tear, so that's often, that's always good news when it doesn't turn out to be the case, but taking an athlete through the process of going from their highest moment to their lowest moment in a matter of seconds, yeah. over the course of a week, they go through all the phases, um, and then building them back up over the course of six, eight, 12 months, and then watching them be successful again on the field. It's my favorite part of being an athletic trainer, but at NYU, with the athletes that we have, with how smart they are, how in tune with what their goals are, and what they're capable of and what resources we have available for them is is really my, my favorite part of being a part of NYU, working with NYU athletes over the years. Absolutely. Um, and right now we are in the, the Paulson Center, uh, the, the new facility. Um, of course, you know, there's a new training room in here. We're still kind of, you know, still kind of finishing touches, getting getting things moved and whatnot, but what are you kind of, what are you excited about, about this building, or will you not be much affected since you're on the road a lot, or, or maybe you're staying at the Palladium training room, things like that, just kind of talk about what that process is like. So, personally, I'm capable of functioning to a high level, at a, at a high level, out of a back, mm -hmm. you know, and many athletic trainers are used to that, being on the road, being, you know, with soccer, we practice down the street, so we often bring everything with right. us and we operate. But having the opportunity to, first of all, everybody being based out of this area of campus and out of this building is huge because we're going to create a culture, yeah. you know, and having a home base for people to mm -hmm. come to that's on campus yeah. and having our medical facility be there in the center piece is, is huge for mm -hmm. us and having our strength and conditioning and having our coaches right here. It's all, it's all going to help the culture. It's going to help with communication. Mm -hmm. It's going to help us feel more cohesive as a group of people. Um, and, and for that reason, I look forward to moving to the new building. Anytime you have something new, you have to be excited about it, right? Well, this building is incredible. It's got so many different parts to it from the, the uh, student part aspect of it to the athlete aspect of it. Um, when we get to host a postseason or even just an in-season game mm -hmm. here, the excitement on campus is, is going to be something we haven't seen here in eight years or right. more since the old building. And our students deserve that. Our staff is excited for that. Mm -hmm. um, for athletic training, having the ability to have multiple practices happening at one time, yeah, we can, <clears throat> you know, we can uh, kind of take a, a step back and, and provide a better quality service um, and reach, connect with more teams on a, on a regular basis and not be spread as thin as we have been over the years. And I think that's been throughout the entire department. Um, throughout New York City, we've spread so wide. Um, so for that is another reason I'm, I'm excited about the new building. Yeah, rightfully so. Rightfully so. A Andrew Neshi made the same point recently where he was like, you know, he was talking about back when he was a student, he goes like the feeling of, and I'm gonna use the sound bite, like when we actually open the building, like the feeling of like a big UAA double header and we actually have a home, had a home for it. Like that was like really special and something that he really, really revered, you know, or just really appreciated having as a student and so excitedly awaits that, you know, on the staff side of things for the next generation of students. Um, 
it's often said in communications that those individuals wear a ton of different hats. And it most definitely is the same case for those as, that are athletic trainers. What are some of those different hats that you wear? Um, well, I mean, first and foremost, the health and well-being of the student athlete mm -hmm. is, is, you know, it's our priority. Right? So um, I think we always look at the in-season, the academic year, um, but we can't lose touch with their athletes over the summer and in the off season. Yeah. You know, their priorities might shift a little bit with academics and internships and whatnot, but staying connected to them outside of the academic year is very, very important. And um, that causes us to wear a little bit different of a hat because now we're shifting from in-season mode and, and athletic training room mode to um, you know more of an email or phone call exchange. Right. And how can I help you where you're at? What can mm -hmm. I do for you where you're at? And injuries occur over the summer too. And if somebody has an injury that, that might affect their season, can we resolve it before the season comes? Yeah. Let's, let's see what we can do. And, and that's just one way that we shift our position from being a in-person clinical therapist to being an over the phone or, or via uh, internet uh, therapist. Um, mm -hmm. So that's just one, one hat. Um, we, like, I think another thing that we do in athletic training is we're, in my experience, my, one of my favorite things to do as an athletic trainer is to watch the team grow mentally mm. within the microcosm of the season right. over the course of four years watch an athlete and a team grow from where where it had been to the success of for example where women's basketball or men's soccer is now yeah. rewind four years we're not even close to that yeah yep. you know and it's on the backs of those student athletes four years ago that got them to this point now and just mm -hmm. either staying connected with those alumni and then just dropping messages here and there saying, how is the team, right. the same mantra in place that Coach is talking about, you know, is the messaging the same, how are the guys, yep. that, that freshman that I saw. And, and that's where our relationships with those student athletes, you know, they, they build from freshman year to senior year mm -hmm. and, the, and the team changes over that time too. And it's, it's incredible to watch those teams transform and with those relationships between the coaches and the athletes that you develop over the four years. Really yeah, I think I think it's really underrated the relationships that you all have with student athletes. I mean, from at least from like outside looking in, because yeah. you especially just seeing it in action, being at home games, being you know a couple of times been on the road and getting to see that and how um, you know obviously you you you're doing your job, you're professional, but in a lot of ways, you're, you're friends in a lot of ways as far as like someone in the athletic department that they can lean on. And, you know, Kyle and I have been super glad and fortunate that we've gotten to know some of the student athletes in the, to the extent that we have, but we, I just know that, you know, what you all do and provide as far as, the, yeah, even just having like that kind of, you know, trustworthy person to lean on in, in this big, you know, athletic department is, is so important. Yeah, I would agree with you because we're, we're, we're seeing them every single day and the comfort level that they have, a student athlete might have with an assistant coach might be different than a head coach. Mm -hmm. And maybe in a moment it's not necessarily even with a coach or a teammate. It might be with the medical staff. It could be with someone else in the department that right. they might gravitate closer to to talk about something they're struggling with or need to look for advice mm -hmm. or even networking opportunities in the future might be something they're yeah. interested in. Um, you know, for us, we hire student athletes or, or we hire students that um, have been athletes to work in our athletic training room. And it's because they take interest in the athletics realm and also medicine. So, um, you know, we bring in student, students from the NYU world into our little bubble and they absolutely thrive. Mm. Because you wear so many different hats, many of which you just mentioned, burnout is very much a real thing managing burnout is is that something that you still feel like you're on your journey on or do you feel like there are some things that you've been able to kind of pick up along the way that have helped with managing burnout well for me managing the stress of any given day is my cup of coffee in the morning is going for a run and mm -hmm. Kyle being on the road with me he knows that yeah. <laughs> I get up and I get my exercise done in the morning and then I can start my day uh, and I aim to get my exercising in, my routine in every single day. And if it happens three times a week, I'm successful. If it happens seven days a week, I'm successful. Um, but if I plan on it, 
um, it helps me manage my stress. So that's that's kind of my, my plan in managing in stress. And, and there's, you know, we have kind of a, a, a slow season and two busy seasons in at NYU in athletics. And by slow, I mean that we're not traveling nearly as much mm. um, one of those seasons. But the other two, we're kind of uh, up and go all the time. And that can be very, very heavy on in anyone. Right to maintain that from August right on through May is yeah. is often unsustainable. Uh, so you have to come up with some adaptation methods. You know, um, we work you know anywhere from you know six days a week, eight hour a day, ten hour a day, twelve hour a day. You know, in August it's go 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 with soccer season and all the student athletes coming back. Um, so and but we know we know that that's the case. So. Um, Oftentimes, when the soccer season is fizzling out, basketball season is picking up, and wrestling is coming in, and track is coming in, so we have a really, really heavy load in October of overlap, and that can be super stressful for us. And then we kind of get a little tiny break in for the holiday, um, but then basketball starts right back up. So, so the burnout often comes, if you start in August, the burnout can often come in January, February, and, and March. Um, it's always easier to manage burnout when a team is being very successful and, mm. and you're, you're around a successful culture because, you know, for me, I thrive in that moment. Mm. Um, but that can also be, uh, you know, uh, a negative when you have other teams that are demanding as well. You have other athletes that are asking for attention. Um, need attention, need, you, you have traumatic injuries that might be coming after surgery from, from say soccer season, and the fall seasons, the overlap that everybody's starting their moment of whatever struggle it is at different times. Um, so as an athletic trainer, you, you really have to be able to balance um, the workload. Uh, that comes in, you know, home balance, you know, work-life balance. Uh, and, and like I said, for me, it's exercise. Um, I like to uh, listen to podcasts. I like to, um, you know, get getting in good conversations with the staff and, and, and even with my athletes so I can reconnect with them. And, and that can kind of give you a little bit of a, a boost in the tougher parts of the year. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And yeah, because that's, that's something that comes up in communications as well. Um, you know, of course, is burnout. It's like home games, we're at all. Been at almost like probably ninety five percent of NYU's home games this year, and then I'm still like, oh, and on the road I still have to write and cover it. But I always have to remind myself that yes, my workload is here, but you all's workload is here. Traveling, balancing that, being at every practice, and all those different things. So um, it's it's certainly it, I can speak from my experience. It's certainly difficult, and you have to set aside that time. You set aside your time to run. And I, if I can make it to the park and play basketball or something, it's a it's a great day, and I kind of got to detach a little bit. But um, and it's always interesting to hear what other people, how other people approach that, for sure. And so, you know, you mentioned a little bit about you know managing burnout. Want us again to our next point here about really just a progression of how much more attention is being paid to mental health over the years. Um, how have you seen that kind of shift from really when you first began? your career and then you know kind of where you are now as you know with some years under your belt so I, I think the mental health piece that's in the forefront of the conversation now um, has for many athletic trainers I think it's always been there it's always been uh, we've always been aware of it we just haven't had the utility belt tools to address it the resources to address it appropriately hasn't been a comfortable thing to talk about for anyone but even for the medical staff. Um, and I think in recent years, especially over the course of my career, it has become something that's much more easily addressed, um, more easily communicated about, um, more attention paid to it. Um, and I think when you're working on a college campus, the staff can have burnout, but you cannot ignore the fact that the student athletes have high expectations academically and athletically. Sure. And as a staff, we're here to 
support them and direct them to the resources that we have available. So constantly making sure that those resources are available and then that the right people are seeing them in a timely manner. And, and that may come, it might be more easy for me because I see the students every day and they might gravitate towards me, but our assistant coaches, our head coaches, our staff members that might be seeing people on campus on a regular basis, just identifying a moment um, for someone and connecting with them is huge. Um, and where in the past, it wouldn't have been something that someone might recognize. Um, yeah. So I think, I think we're going in a, in a great direction as a culture, uh, recognizing mental health and how to treat it. Um, certainly at NYU, uh, we're constantly looking at how we can provide the best services for those student athletes. Mm, absolutely. Um, and we've talked a ton about traveling and different trips, but do you have like a favorite trip, city, moment on the road with the team over these, over these years? So there's a couple um, things that stand out to me. I, uh, anytime a team earns their way to the postseason, it is incredible. It's an incredible feeling. It's an incredible thing to be a part of. Um, winning a UAA championship, it just helps solidify all the hard work everyone's put in to the program. Um, and those are always feel good memories. Mm -hmm. um, I mentioned watching an athlete come back from a very, very tough injury. Um, those moments for the medical staff and, and for myself is, is always a highlight of, of a career for me. Um, a number of years ago, I was able to travel with teams to Europe Damn. And, and play, we played games in Spain and in Italy on, on separate trips. And that experience uh, with the university as an educational piece mm was incredible because we watched to see how sport was interpreted and used at other in other cultures right. at, at different levels over there um, and then also saw and we were able to see a lot of the educational things in those those cities that we went to um, and I've been able to go to Cuba with teams and I've been able to go to Spain and Italy with teams um, and I've traveled around America with teams um, not just in the college collegiate level but but with you know high school teams um, and professional teams, mm -hmm. and, right. and it's you know the ability to travel outside of your little bubble and see how sport can connect you in other places yeah. is is a highlight for me. Whether it's in America or outside yeah. of America, it's still being able to do that. So I'll always love traveling to Chicago yeah. and Atlanta, mm -hmm. and I always try to find a new place to run in yeah. in you know Case Western, so in in, in uh, Pittsburgh or in, in Cleveland. Right. And uh, so I think the NYU um, experience is much like a Division One in that way, where we sure get to is, go yeah. up and up and travel. Um, so that that's another highlight. Yeah. Yeah. When we were heading home from Ohio just a few weeks ago, uh, the, first of all, the line at the Ohio airport, unbelievable. It was like 5:30 in the morning. It was like a thousand people. We were like, "What is this?" this? Cleveland. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In Cleveland, we were like, all right, well, good thing we saved 90 minutes for this, and we made it with, like, 12 minutes to spare. And we weren't panicking, but we were just like, this is an absurd line. Roy was like, or rather, a couple of guys on the men's basketball team had TSA pre-checked. I don't, so I was just on the line. They obviously got comfortable at the gate real early. Roy goes, you don't have it? And I said, no. I said, but you should have it because you travel a good amount. And he goes, well, in theory, I should be home, you know, for some of the duties that I have. Because you're traveling a lot, do you have TSA pre-check? So I actually do have it. Yeah, you gotta have it. You gotta uh, have it. You're playing it right. You know, it's funny because a lot of our student athletes have it already because they just they they are comfortable and they're they're well practiced in traveling even before they even come to NYU. So when they're waiting at the gate before you, it's like, all right, what are we doing? <laughs> <laughs> you know, like, come on, um, right. get out of here. Like, get a flex on me. I, I, yeah. yeah. I got to yeah. get over there in that fast lane. Um, right. You know, so look, you got to be prepared to travel. You got to, you got to, you got to do your homework on, on, on where to go and, and leave you enough time to, to get everything done you need to. And you got to get there early. You, once you get there early, you can get work done at the gate. It's true. Exactly. It's true. Time is money. Nope. <laughs> time is money. Right. 
So yeah. So yeah, maybe maybe uh, that should be supported um, across the board for I, us. I would agree. But I love when idea. you guys travel with us because I think you're able to highlight some of the moments in the moment better than some of the you know the coaches in the athletic. Yeah, because they got other stuff should, stuff yeah, going yeah, on. Yeah. You guys, Absolutely. you guys, you know. Uh, and it's nice to travel as as a staff. Too. It is. Uh-huh. It is nice to travel. So hopefully yeah. that's something that we can do yeah. moving forward. I certainly like having more administrators on on the road with us. Yeah. No, it's been fun. It's, it's been definitely been fun. fun. I mean, the two trips we've been on have been a lot of fun. And it, it, you and I have gotten to know each other really well through really that. I mean, if not through that, we see each other. Seriously. You know, here and there. Week, if that, probably yeah. less. If so. that. If that, except when we'll, we'll, Kai and I are spraining our ankles playing pickup basketball at Palladium. That's when we come to go see Matt. Matt. Yeah. <laughs> oh, man. How's yeah. that doing? You haven't come back since. You it's a good thing. It. <laughs> yeah. It's agonizing, but you fixed it. Yeah. You know what you're doing. Right. Oh. Yeah, no, we definitely enjoy traveling as well. Janice, I was talking to Janice Quinn. What's her title? Senior Woman Administrator and Senior. senior, senior so- okay. Is she also our SWA, though? I don't know. Probably. Probably. Yeah, I think so. Anyways. I think so. Anyways, I was talking with Janice recently, like literally just last week, and she goes like, when you look across the board at athletics, like everyone, like like this is the most that we've had simultaneously performing at this high of a level. Like like everyone's going, like nearly everyone's going to like national tournaments, et cetera. And like obviously that means we're busy, but like it's a good busy, right? Because like we're rooting for people along the way. So yeah, I mean, exactly like you said, like enjoying having more administrators to travel, like we're getting more reasons to travel. So that's been pretty cool. It goes back to that burnout, right? It's true. And you're going to be burned out no matter what. Mm-hmm. But when your team is being successful and the teams that you're a part of are being successful, being a highlight, being part of those moments and being able to highlight yeah. those yeah. moments yeah. makes all that hard work a little bit more worth it. 100%. Mm-hmm. 100%. Yeah, totally agree. Um, Kai, you want to take our last point here? Yeah, for sure. Um, you know, it is Athletic Training Recognition Month after all. I mean, you know, it's it's – it's great that we have you on during this month. We've been just kind of meaning to do it anyway for, for a bit now. Um, but, you know, what is, I guess, kind of your impression? What does it mean to you? And, you know, the slogan of the month, kind of there's an AT for that. What's your take on that and kind of your thoughts around this month? Yeah, I think I think it's nice, especially in college sports, to be recognized as a profession. Uh, have a couple of moments to, to, you know, you're always, as an athletic trainer, you're always in the back of the uh, – Behind the yeah, bench, absolutely. you know, uh, in, 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 the, in, the, in the back of the scene. Um, so any, any opportunity to highlight how we're able to influence the student athletes and, and the success of the teams is, is a great thing for athletic training and, and really a great thing for, um, for our students to be able to recognize that and our staff to be able to recognize that. Um, to your point of athletic trainers wear a lot of hats, uh, the mantra for the month is, as we said, there's an, there's an AT for that, for that um, which highlights how many things athletic trainers are capable of. And a couple of things that we talked about was injuries and mental health. Like we recognize those things and can provide the direction necessary to recover from those things. And I think um, that's just two things that we highlighted here, but there are a lot of different ways that athletic trainers can be utilized in the real world. Um, and they can relate to the weekend warrior. They can relate to you know a, an everyday person that's just you know working on this say the light pole outside, always lifting their hands over their head. And and there's professions now where athletic trainers are gravitating towards those 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 areas. Mm-hmm. Um, so th- I think that's the theme that the NATA is trying to highlight that there's an athletic trainer that can service. Many different populations. Yeah. yeah. No, well, well put. Sure. There's, um, I was just thinking about, you know, what you were saying about, like, r- really to the effect of the unsung hero. You know, even if it's not heroic, like, certainly behind the scenes. In uh, at my undergrad alma mater in Massachusetts, Wheaton College, um, they had this, they had this cool award at the end of the year for their end of year banquet. We're going to have one too. I'm super excited for it. Um, I don't know if we're going to have something like this. And if not this year, would love to see it implemented in the future. What Wheaton has is called the Claudia Freeze Special Recognition Award. And I just wanted to pull it up. It was an award established in 1983 and intended to recognize the kind of less visible behind the scenes dedication to the athletic program exhibited by any member of the Wheaton community. And just looking at the list here, it's been 
been a ton of people that have worked in physical therapy, um, obviously in sports medicine as well. I won the award as a senior, so that was pretty cool. But um, but no, I would love to see that implemented here, not only to kind of further bolster our sense of community that we have, but to even take it a step further, you know, kind of uplifting people that, like you said, are typically behind the bench, right? Like kind of are, are not seen because there's still three hours until game time. And then it's been like, oh, let's like the game ended two hours ago. Like, why are you still there? like that? That is exactly what I hope. You know, we can kind of, um, you know, bring to the to the spotlight, deservedly so, through an award like that, like of that sort. So that would be awesome to have yeah. to have to highlight, um, you know, the staff in, in so many ways, um, especially the ones that are not, you know, uh, out on the court and out on the field every day at practice, sure. behind the scenes. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we'll we'll bring it to the uh, we'll bring it to the to the drawing board. And see how it gets received. Hopefully, 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 all good. Fingers crossed. Uh, Matt, do you have anything for us before we uh, before we split out of here? Um, no, I, you know, I, I thank you for the opportunity to talk about myself and athletic training, my experiences here at NYU. Um, I hope uh, our student athletes are inspired to be successful. Uh, meet with their staff, meet with their student, their fellow student athletes, and and uh, create goals for themselves to win UAA. And, and compete at the highest level because uh, it's fun, it's exciting, and uh, you know I think the future of NYU athletics is is bright. Yes. Yeah, um, as you said, Janice pointed out that there are a lot of successful athletes in, in the university right now, and it can only improve when we come back to a home base, and the culture can improve, mm -hmm. and the, the communication and all those things, and and we're all part of it. And I'm excited for that when we do get the opportunity to all move back into this building. Seconded. Agreed. Yeah, for sure. Matt, thank you so much. It's been a lot of fun. Thanks for joining us. We're excited, too. Keep it locked, too. Go on NYUathletics.com, at NYU Athletics, across the board on social. New episode every Monday. Took a mental health break this past week, but sure enough, it was a perfect, perfect guest to have um, coming off of the, the little one-week absence. So, um, again, episode 15 is in the books. Thank you all for watching.